governor coming out right now, so let's listen in. He's going to give us an update on the coronavirus vaccine distribution here in Maryland. So let's take a listen. Good evening. Uh, joining me are Major, Major General Tim Gowan of the Maryland National Guard and Dr. Jinlene Chan, Deputy Secretary at the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, we begin 2021 at a critical moment in the war against COVID-19, which uh, continues to pose a serious threat to our state and our nation. While the initial launch of vaccine distributions does offer us a glimmer of hope, uh, we still have a long way to go in this fight. Distributing and administering vaccines throughout 2021 will be, uh, without question, the greatest peacetime undertaking in American history. And it will be a massive, all hands on deck, ongoing operation involving the federal, state, and local governments and the private sector. Over the last nearly three weeks, uh, we have already successfully allocated, deployed, and distributed 270,150 doses of vaccines directly into the hands of our frontline vaccinators at hospitals, nursing homes, and local health departments to begin phase 1A uh, vulnerable population vaccinations. This represents 98.7% of all the doses that the federal government uh, allotted to the state of Maryland. Only 1.3%, um, 3,727 doses have been retained by the state at the uh, state health department for emergency backup reserve purposes. Um, 270,150 Doses have already been deployed to uh, every single hospital in Maryland, to all 24 uh, of our local health departments across the state, and to CVS and Walgreens, uh, which have a federal contract to handle all of our nursing homes across the state uh, and to support the vaccination of uh, our Maryland uh, frontline workers at federal facilities. We've distributed them out to our Maryland uh, frontline healthcare workers who work in both federal facilities uh, and to those who work in facilities in DC, Marylanders who work in hospitals in the district. Uh, 163,225 were sent to every Maryland hospital for critical frontline uh, workers. To date, those hospitals have administered 55,000 941 doses, which is 34.3% of the doses which we provided them. Some of our hospitals are doing extremely well, already utilizing as much as 67% of their total allocations, while others are still just ramping up. Uh, the slowest hospital in the state has completed only 16% of their allocation. Uh, we have also deployed 200 doses to every uh, one of our county health departments and they have begun uh, vaccinating their vaccinators, uh, EMTs and first responders so that they could then in turn start up their county vaccination clinics. Uh, local health departments have already administered 11,401 uh, doses which is 32.4 percent of uh, what we have deployed to them. Five counties have done a remarkable job and have already completed 80% or more of their phase 1A vaccinations. Uh, that includes Howard, Montgomery, St. Mary's, uh, Calvert, and Caroline counties. Other counties are just beginning uh, to ramp up their operations. Uh, 61,425 doses were sent directly uh, to CVS and Walgreens, which have a federal contract to administer vaccines in all 227 of our nursing homes. Uh, to date, CVS and Walgreens have entered 
into our system data showing the completion of 8,503 doses, or just 13.8%, uh, uh, which is actually close to on par with the numbers that they're doing nationwide. Uh, but we've been working hard uh, to the, get to the bottom of all of these uh, provider issues. So I have uh, contacted Health and Human Services Secretary Alex, Alex Azar, to express our uh, serious concerns about the pace of the federal nursing home, uh, home uh, pharmacy program. In addition, I had uh, long and I would say uh, productive discussions earlier today with both uh, the CEO of CVS, uh, who said that they had actually done nearly twice as many vaccinations in Maryland as are being reported, uh, that they um, are now working with our team to correct data reporting issues that they had not entered the data into our system yet. Um, I also spoke with the CEO of Walgreens who said that um, they, are they have now scheduled clinics at every single one of the nursing homes they're responsible for that they've been assigned under uh, uh, the federal criteria of the ones that they've been assigned. Uh, we're going to continue to stay on top of this. We're going to be in close contact with CVS and Walgreens to continue monitoring their progress and seeing what we can do to help them uh, continue to ramp up uh, their vaccinations. Uh, most of the states in America are having very similar issues uh, with those contracts. Uh, so we have also reached out to the National Governors Association uh, in an effort to begin uh, some joint dialogues between uh, all of the nation's governors, our federal partners, and uh, between these pharmacies that are conducting those contracts. Uh, while none of us are thrilled with the pace of this rollout uh, over the first couple of weeks, I can assure you that it is improving every day. Um, our numbers in Maryland are in line with the rest of the nation, and in fact, we're ahead of 27 other states. Uh, the good news uh, is that these vaccines have arrived years ahead of schedule. Uh, and that they are ramping up much faster than they did uh, when we were back in the spring dealing with testing, uh, back when we led the nation. Uh, but it took us almost nine months to go from 50 tests a day to 50,000. Uh, today alone, Maryland reported a record 11,553 new vaccinations uh, for a cumulative total of 76,000. Uh, 916 vaccinations, and I'm pleased to report that uh, as of today, second doses have already begun at uh, Maryland hospitals. I want to assure the people of Maryland that we are going to leverage every single resource at our disposal to get more shots into more arms as quickly as we possibly can in a safe and orderly way. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to make sure that Marylanders understand exactly how this vaccine distribution process works. Each week, the federal government informs each of the states of their allocation. After that, they open up uh, their ordering system. The federal government has a system, it's called Tiberius. And then states are then able to place our orders directly with them as to where they should ship uh, those doses, and we're able to then notify our uh, providers, the, the frontline vaccinators, and then they can immediately begin to have their clinics ready to receive those doses and to begin vaccinating. So in these early couple of weeks, um, there is a little bit of a lag time. Um, those orders um, are shipped out directly to the providers, to those vaccinators, um, straight from the CDC through Operation Warp Speed. And that process takes about a week, uh, can take as much as a week. Uh, but vaccine administration uh, is the responsibility of each of those providers. For example, in phase 1A that we're in right now, uh, it is the federal contract with CVS and Walgreens that's responsible for our nursing homes. Maryland hospitals are the ones who are doing their own staffs. Uh, and uh, frontline health care workers in those hospitals. And our 24 county health departments are receiving their doses directly for their own health department staffs and their county's first responders. All of these 
providers, I can assure you, have a desire to get these vaccines into the arms of the people who need them as quickly as they possibly can. And no one is attempting to delay. Um, all of us um, are doing our best uh, to work together at all levels of government uh, and with our private sector partners to get all of our frontline vaccinators uh, whatever resources they need to accelerate the process and to do their jobs as effectively and efficiently as they possibly can. Uh, but today I'm announcing some additional steps uh, which we believe will help providers get more shots into more arms even quicker uh, in a safe and efficient manner. Last month uh, I reactivated the Maryland National Guard to provide uh, support to state health officials uh, for the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Beginning tomorrow, the Guard will begin to dispatch emergency vaccination support teams across the state to assist local health departments with the expansion of their vaccination capacity. Each of these emergency teams will include 14 guards, Guard members who will actually assist with the administering uh, of vaccines and who will also be able to help provide logistical support for vaccination clinics. Uh, through our Maryland Response Medical Reserve Corps, which I announced uh, earlier, um, uh, the, the, of retired uh, and or volunteer health workers, we have already identified 700 uh, qualified people who are ready and willing to assist local health departments and other uh, clinics with the administering of shots and we're sharing that information with county health departments to help enable them to expand their clinics to seven day a week operations. We've also offered uh, assistance to the Maryland Hospital Association and offered every single resource at our disposal including additional vaccinators, uh, logistics support, PPE or whatever we can possibly provide to help them uh, speed up their pace of vaccinating their workers. Uh, slow and uneven data reporting uh, has made it extremely difficult to determine where uh, there are issues with vaccine administration. Um, certain people have said that they're doing thousands of vaccinations, but they have not, some hospitals haven't reported any at all, even though they have done quite a bit. We're trying to fix that. Um, we need to uh, address uh, these reporting lags, particularly uh, not with some of the hospitals, but also with CVS and Walgreens. Walgreens and CVS were given 70, 72 hours to do their reporting under their federal contract, uh, whereas we're requiring others to do 24 hours. So I had those discussions with the, pres the CEO and president of Walgreens and CVS today. And today I am issuing uh, an executive order which requires all providers in the state of Maryland to report data onto our system, Immunet, within 24 hours after vaccines are administered. And we will be posting this data publicly and using it to track the progress of every single provider in the state. Um, the Maryland Department of Health is also uh, issuing an order today uh, which states that any facility which has not administered at least 75% of their total uh, first dose allocation may have their future allocations reduced uh, until they can prove their ability to meet capacity requirements. Any provider that has excess doses will be required to notify their local health department so that those doses can be reallocated uh, to other priority populations. Effective immediately, uh, we will be adopting a new uh, what I'm calling a Southwest Airlines model, a rolling vaccine allocation model. Um, no doses should be sitting in freezers, uh, going unused, waiting, uh, or backing up while others are in need of more. So uh, we're going to be adjusting the plan to say that uh, we're going to be no longer be waiting for all of the members of a particular priority group to be completed. Uh, before we move on to begin that next group uh, and the next group in line. Our message uh, to those who are responsible for doing the vaccinations is clear. 
either use the doses that you have been allocated or they will be redirected to another facility or provider uh, where they will be used immediately. Every single week, uh, we will be continuing to push out vaccines to our hospitals, pharmacies, local health departments, and to all the other vaccinators across the state based on need and on utilization. As soon as we uh, move forward from this initial phase 1A, uh, which is a, an extremely limited supply, uh, we will then be able to scale up to broader vaccination clinics across the state. However, I want to make this uh, point clear. Uh, the states are wholly reliant on the federal government and on those two uh, vaccine suppliers, producers, for the supply of vaccines. In the first three weeks, uh, we uh, and the other states, uh, we've received 4.4 percent, uh, enough vaccines for 4.4 percent of our population. Uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, and until, uh, less than until there's an increase in production, of new vaccines from, from those producers, or until new vaccines are approved uh, and made available, uh, we expect to receive about uh, 72,000 doses per week uh, from the federal government, which is roughly 10,000 doses per day. Um, now, we're all hopeful that it will increase from there, uh, and we all expect and hope that it will, but right now that's those are the real numbers that we're counting on. Yesterday, we already did more than that by vaccinating uh, 11,553 Marylanders in one day, uh, exceeding our daily allotment. So, you know, at the current pace of allocation from our federal partners, uh, we would expect to have 1.8 million doses by the end of May. Uh, which would represent only 30 percent of our state's population. Uh, so this is going to be a long haul. Uh, you know, Dr. Fauci said, you know, the other day on television that we could expect to have 60 percent of the national population vaccinated by the fall. Uh, so that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, that this week, as I mentioned, uh, we have already begun second doses for some. Um, and not only that, but we have also already expanded our Phase 1A populations. We are now all licensed, registered, and certified health care providers anywhere in the state are now uh, eligible for vaccination. Uh, local health departments have now begun uh, to make arrangements with providers to get them all vaccinated in the coming days and weeks. Uh, vaccinations uh, will also uh, soon be underway for all law enforcement agencies, correctional officers, and judiciary staff. Uh, but just phase 1A is more than a half million Marylanders. So if you look at that pyramid we have, that little tiny piece at the top with is the 1A is a half million people. Uh, so I just urge people to be patient as you think about people are like, when am I getting it? Why, why isn't everybody done? It's a, it's a massive undertaking. Uh, today, based on the recommendations of the Federal Advisory Committee on uh, Immunization Practices, which is comprised of public health experts on the use of vaccines, we are announcing uh, updates to our Phase 1 of, of Maryland's uh, statewide vaccination plan. Um, our new Phase 1B will now include all Marylanders over the age of 75. It will also be expanded to include special needs group homes, high risk inmates, developmentally disabled populations, uh, continuity of government vaccinations, as well as teachers, child care, and education staff. Uh, the Maryland Department, the State Department of Education, uh, has already begun, but they're going to continue to immediately begin uh, coordination with all of our county school systems to prepare uh, the implementation of their plans to vaccinate uh, this critical personnel. Uh, overall, uh, this revised Phase 1B of our plan now includes uh, approximately 860,000 additional Marylanders. 
based on the current rate of allocation, we anticipate the state being able to uh, move into phase 1B at the end of January. We will, uh, we have uh, updated our phase 1C to now include all Marylanders aged 65 to 74 and workers in additional uh, critical uh, sectors including grocery stores, public transit, agricultural production and manufacturing. Uh, phase 1C now includes an additional 772,000 Marylanders. Based on the current rate, and again, we're hoping to see that exponentially increase on the, in the months ahead, but based in the weeks and months ahead, but based on the current rate of the allocation that we're receiving from the federal government, we expect to be able to move into phase 1C sometime in March. Our newly updated phase 2 will now include Marylanders ages 16 to 64 who are at increased risk of COVID-19 illness due to comorbidities, uh, as well as essential workers in critical utilities and other sectors. So phase two uh, will now include another 1.1 million Marylanders. Now obviously um, people have many questions uh, about when uh, they will be eligible. They have many concerns about the safety of the vaccines. Um, and we're going to continue to try to provide as much information and answer as many questions as possible. But here are some of the ways that you can help to stay informed. Uh, first, the state will be issuing regular vaccination updates through our statewide 211 texting service. To opt in to receive these alerts, text MD Ready to 898 211 so that you can receive updates as soon as possible, as soon as new information becomes available. Second, Marylanders are encouraged to visit covidlink.maryland.gov for all available resources that we have on the state vaccination plan, along with all the safety information regarding the vaccines. And lastly, um, we ask everybody to be patient, as this will be a long process. Uh, already, we are seeing instances where people are uh, attempting to cut the line uh, and, uh, and cheat the rules and uh, take appointments away uh, from our frontline health care workers. Uh, not only is this uh, reprehensible behavior, uh, but it also slows down the entire process. Um, the more steps that our vaccinators and our providers have to put in place and add to verify uh, you know, the, the, the uh, vaccine recipients, the longer that this is going to take for everyone to get their vaccines. So please um, exercise decency and common sense. Uh, while these vaccines do offer us a light at the end of the tunnel and allow us to look ahead, uh, to the day the pandemic will no longer disrupt our lives or prevent us from uh, like getting back to normal or seeing our loved ones or getting back to work or to school. Right now, we're still in the thick of this fight. Um, Maryland's seven-day positivity rate uh, did drop a little bit today to 9.19%, but it's still much higher than we want it to be. Uh, our statewide uh, case rate increased slightly today to 44.0%. Now, all 24 of our jurisdictions are still in the red zone for cases, according to the federal government. As of today, um, 1,771 COVID patients are hospitalized in the state. Fortunately, uh, this is 8,300 uh, beds below what Hopkins had uh, projected for the beginning of January, which is great. Uh, better treatments have clearly helped to improve our ability to fight the virus and to keep our hospitalization stable. As of today, the percentage of new cases that lead to hospitalizations has fallen by 72% since April. The percentage of new cases that lead to death has fallen by 67% since early May. And the percentage of hospitalizations that end in death has fallen by 48% since early July. These are 
really encouraging numbers. Um, we continue to utilize the alternate care uh, sites we opened in the spring. Um, our critical care coordination center uh, still continuing to transfer patients. All of our surge preparations are so that we're still uh, ready to handle any additional surges that may happen. Um, we are concerned about this much more contagious uh, variant of the virus that originated in the UK. It's now, as of today, with the addition of Georgia, has been detected in five states and at least uh, 33 countries so far. Um, our public health laboratory is uh, testing uh, for the variant at, at five times the national rate, or testing every single day. Uh, and luckily, we have not yet uh, detected a, a, a case connected to it yet here in Maryland. Uh, but this is another reason why we all need to uh, keep being vigilant while we focus on getting uh, these vaccines ramped up and to our frontline healthcare workers and our most vulnerable. Um, as I have said throughout this entire crisis, uh, we are all in this together, and we will get through this together uh, by staying Maryland strong. This time, I'm going to turn it over to General Gowan to discuss a little more detail uh, of some of the uh, support the Guard will pro be providing to our counties. General. Thank you, Governor Hogan, for your leadership throughout this challenging time. And thanks are in order for every Marylander who has come together to work so tirelessly to combat the spread of COVID-19. As most of you are aware, the Maryland National Guard has a dual mission. Our soldiers and airmen are generally seen either deploying overseas to fight America's wars or putting on the uniform here at home to provide aid during a natural disaster. Last March through July, 1,500 Maryland National Guard members were activated to combat this pandemic. During that time, our troops assisted with the processing and distribution of more than 59 million pieces of personal protective equipment, and we proudly distributed more than a million meals throughout the state. Our medical support team screened and tested more than 22,000 people, including high-risk residents at 227 skilled nursing facilities. We all continue to experience immense challenges related to COVID, but the vaccine provides hope. Hope of not only slowing this virus, but defeating it. Over the last several months, I've assigned some of my best planners to support the Maryland Department of Health to help prepare for this vaccination effort. As the governor mentioned, starting tomorrow, we will provide direct support to county health departments with mobile vaccination support teams with the mission of accelerating vaccination efforts. A Maryland National Guard mobile vaccination support team consists of 9 to 14 medical professionals. Initially, we will have close to 200 personnel organized in 14 teams. Additionally, we're providing manpower to support congregate care and long-term health facilities and additional manpower to support county health department testing activities, call assistance, call center assistance, data center analysis, and logistical, logistical support. Our medical, medical, military medical specialists are world-class professionals who live and work in the communities they serve. These unique capabilities are well-suited and integrated when we work alongside our interagency partners and communities. This is an initial capability that we're fully prepared to execute and will continue to provide the support to the, to, to the governor as directed. I want to thank all the people of this great state for their support and generosity to be shown to the Maryland National Guard. We are honored to support the great state by serving on the front lines in the communities where we reside and work. Your Maryland National Guard is always there, always ready, old line. I'll be followed by Dr. Chan of the Maryland Department of Health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General Gowan. Thank you, Governor Hogan. Um, I'm glad to be here this afternoon, this evening, um, to 
make remarks about our vaccine rollout. Um, we're beginning the new year with hope um, as vaccines have started to roll out in the state as the governor mentioned. You know, there's a lot of work that's being involved in terms of this vaccine rollout. And there are more than 500,000 individuals who are in phase 1A, which are comprised of the healthcare workers and the nursing home residents um, and first responders. Our hospitals have been administrating uh, vaccines to their staff members and again to some of their community healthcare workers and others. Our federal partners, CVS and Walgreens, has also been administering vaccines in long-term care facilities, and our local health departments have now been provided vaccines and are ramping up their vaccination efforts at the local level. As of this week, again, emphasizing that all the licensed, registered, and certified healthcare workers in the state of Maryland are now eligible for vaccination and distribution to first responders and others, including 911 specialists and correctional officers are just beginning at the local level and will ramp up in the next few weeks. I've been speaking to a number of health officers around the state and talking about their vaccine clinics and about the work that they've been doing to stand up those clinics, training staff and others um, to make sure that vaccines are administered safely and effectively and efficiently. Um, they have all been implementing the plans that have been developed over the course of many years and more specifically over the last few months. Many have started to vaccinate not only their first responders but even other healthcare workers um, and they continue to reach out to those populations and now with appointments, um, those, that information will be more available to healthcare workers. We also want to appreciate, of course, the National Guard for standing up to support their efforts. Local health departments have been working alongside of National Guard and all of our um, public health and healthcare workers around the state to respond to COVID-19. So testing and contact tracing and other efforts continue. And now they are standing up a monumental vaccination effort across the state. And so it is all hands on deck. And so we very much appreciate the support of the governor as well as the National Guard and others in this effort. Over the last few weeks, we've been working very closely both with our federal as well as state partners to ensure that vaccines get to facilities in Maryland. And as the governor illustrated, it does take some time from the time that they tell us that we have a vaccine allocation to when we order it and then when it actually gets delivered here to the state to directly to a certain facility. And that's before vaccination even begins. And so over the last few weeks, our hospitals and local health departments in implementing their plans, there's a lot that's been happening behind the scenes, including staff training and education, communications to the eligible groups, coordination with local providers, coordination with uh, local counterparts in um, fire and EMS, for example. In addition, they had to set up appointment schedules and making sure that the clinics are set up securely and safely and also with adequate room to accommodate um, all of our COVID-19 precautions to avoid crowding in these vaccine clinics. So all of this has been happening behind the scenes that perhaps people may not fully appreciate, but this is a lot of the logistics and the operational work that our local health departments, our hospitals, and our CVS and Walgreens partners have been doing every day for the last few weeks. So many Marylanders who are currently eligible to get vaccinated, so now we're expanding to include all healthcare providers, um, will be able to be get to get a link to vaccine appointments and um, including instructions for how to make those appointments um, whether it's at their uh, long-term care facility um, within their hospital or the local health department again i would emphasize that the unauthorized use of these private registration links that are intended for someone else and directed towards healthcare workers Really, if someone uses it in an unauthorized way, it takes spots away from our healthcare heroes who really are at the front lines of caring for individuals, not only with COVID-19, but with so many other conditions. And that is our first most priority. 
Vaccines will become available to more and more Marylanders, and we are looking forward to advancing into the next phases of our plan as soon as we possibly can, again, dependent on the supply of vaccines that comes to the state. As we expand into phase 1B populations, and as we receive more vaccine, we also do anticipate expanding the number of providers who will be able to register in our Immunet system and begin to receive vaccines themselves to vaccinate the population. So again, as we expand into 1B, 1C, and beyond, we also will be expanding the number of providers um, who receive vaccines. So this includes federally qualified healthcare centers, primary care centers, urgent cares, pharmacies, and other locations that people are accustomed to receiving vaccine. So I wanted to shift gears and just touch for a moment um, to a topic that the governor also alluded to, and that's about the UK variant. So like um, uh, what I wanted to talk about was that um, you know, we know that viruses generally will morph. Um, and we've seen that even COVID has had some changes genetically over time, but those changes have not really impacted the, its ability to spread or other um, characteristics. However, in this um, particular instance, what we have seen is that um, both UK and in South Africa, I believe, have announced um, that they've seen some new variants that may change some of the characteristics of the way that the virus has spread. And as the governor mentioned, there are some states here in the United States that have already detected the variant here. So it is possible that because of travel, because of other uh, means of spread, that um, that the variant is here in Maryland, um, but we are staying extremely vigilant. We are working very closely with our CDC partners, and we are conducting the sequencing that is needed to be able to detect um, the potential variant here in Maryland. While it does appear to, uh, to spread more easily, we have not seen any evidence that it actually causes more hospitalizations or severe disease, or that it increases the risk of death, and that is important to understand. In addition, um, I know a question ha questions have been raised about whether or not these vaccines that we are rolling out would be effective against this new variant. And right now the answer is that it appears that it will be, but there is more study that's being done. The vaccines themselves actually protect and create antibodies against multiple parts of the spike protein. And so the change in this particular virus is really only one part of that spike protein that the va uh, vaccine is protective against. And so we believe that the vaccine will be protective against both this strain and others. Our public health officials continue to study COVID-19 variants to make sure that we can control their spread and we ask that Marylanders continue to wear a mask, practice social distancing, and wash their hands, refrain from large gatherings, and other basic public health measures to prevent the spread. You know, as we roll forward, I know that um, in discussing our new uh, 1A and 1B prioritization groups. Other states have been doing the same, um, including in Florida and Texas and others. And we have seen that other states have had long lines um, and calls to call centers that really inundated their systems. And I would say that, you know, in my experience, um, in 2009 with H1N1, when we actually began to get H1N1 vaccine, we received them in the hundreds, so very, very few. So we created an appointment system, which got quickly overwhelmed with hundreds, if not thousands of calls. And we don't want that to happen here in Maryland, which is why we are implementing a phased in approach as the governor has outlined. I know that this um, you know, continu will continue to be something that we work towards and that in the coming days and weeks, we will have more vaccine here in Maryland and for Marylanders. And our goal continues to be making sure that every Marylander who wants a vaccine will have access to it. We encourage people to learn more about the vaccine through trusted sources such as our website, covidlink.maryland.gov. Um, while we are still now in the early stages of ramping this up, 
the governor has been really strong in his messaging to all of us and our providers that this has to be an all hands on deck effort. And so thank you all for all of the work that you're doing. Thank you for the work that you're doing to prevent the continued spread of COVID-19 here in the state of Maryland. So thank you and good evening. Thank you, Dr. Chan. With that, we'll take some questions. Governor, with the executive order, what recourse does the state have if CBS and Walgreens don't comply with the system of the vaccinations they're getting within 24 hours? Um, they've both, uh, both the, the, C, the CEOs of both corporations have assured me that they will. And um, our teams were working all day today from the health department and uh, CVS and Walgreens to uh, try to work through any kinks to figure out how we can make sure that they will report within 24 hours. But there's no recourse? Uh, I think we will have recourse. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what that will be. Hopefully we won't need to utilize it, but it's, it has the full force and effect of law. I mean, it is a federal contract, but they do have to follow our directives. <laughs> In terms of recourse for those you have said cheating and going in front of the line of vaccine, will there be any uh, harsh rules uh, <clears throat> against those who take what vaccine you have? I mean, really, they're, they're they can't get a vaccine, so, uh, but they, we just, it just comes up the process. So uh, if, if you're not qualified, you're not going to get one, and you should just not slow it down for everybody else. Governor, Dr. Fauci told us last week that uh, in the process here that no one is to blame for the slow rollout because it's yeah. such a massive undertaking. Yeah, I do. I, I said the same thing on television uh, a week and a half ago or so or two weeks ago. Um, look, it, it, this is no time, I don't think, to be pointing fingers. It's a massive undertaking. And, and the good news, there is good news and bad news. The good news is it is way ahead of schedule. And the good news is, as I said, we're getting vaccines into arms. And that's, that's a hopeful, positive message. And we actually started the second doses. Bad news is it's not going as fast as anyone wants. And I'm not going to, look, I'm not going to be happy until we're done. And I'm going to keep pushing and driving, you know, 24-7. And I'm not going to leave any stone unturned until we can get it done. That's just the way I am. So I'm never going to be satisfied. But I don't, want to, I don't want to place blame anywhere. Like right now, our whole focus has been how do we help the hospitals finish their job? How do we help the counties get more done? How do we, I was spent all day with how do we get, get CVS and right, I mean, how do I tell, two national corporations what to do with their federal contract, but I'm trying to help fix it, getting the other governors and the feds involved. I just want to help fix the problem. Uh, but I don't want to blame. I think it's everybody's trying to do their best. There's not one particular glitch in the system. Um, look, it's, it's only been, it's been less than three weeks. And it, again, it comes every day, right? So only the first two hospitals got the first couple doses like two and a half weeks ago in Maryland. The first nursing homes, it was like a week ago or 10 days ago or something. They got them, the first two places got it on January 23rd. We had two holidays in between. And a lot of the staff wasn't there. People are gone. They were just setting up new systems. They didn't know how to enter the data. They didn't have the people trained. Look, yesterday, yesterday we did 11,600. That's more than they gave us for the day. We're going to catch up. It's gonna, we're going to outpace. We're going to be getting to the point where we go, we don't have any more vaccines. We're gonna, it's, I guarantee you it's going to switch. It's not like, how come you haven't used them? It's going to be like, hey, when are we going to get some more? That's, that's going to be, we're going to be switching, to, flipping a switch here in a couple of weeks. Governor Hogan, you, um, you showed on a graphic that there are some counties, including Howard and I think maybe Carroll or Caroline, that are nearly done with phase 1A. Yeah, Montgomery, Howard, uh, uh, Car uh, Carroll or Caroline, Caroline, Caroline County, and a couple others, are 80, 80-some, 80 90%. Yeah, that's not absolutely not true. Everybody's been given the same guidance. They've been working with the county health departments exactly the same way almost every single day. Um, you know, uh, Prince George's County and Baltimore City are very far behind, but we're going to try to provide them every bit of help we can. If we have to send the National Guard in to help them, we're going to be there. We're going to do whatever, whatever, whatever it takes to get them up to speed. Well, I explained that earlier. That's the way the process works. I mean, I heard, you know, Anne Arundel County's complaining that we just found out about them. Well, that is the way it's going to happen. That's, you know, they tell us like on Thursday, this is what you're going to get. We then get online, we place the order, we tell, this is, we tell them that's what you're going to get. You may get it on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, we don't know, but you're going to get this. That's, 
But we're not holding out on them. That's the way the process works. That's the way it's going to work. They can whine about it, or they can get to work and do their job. Yeah. Some say only 50% of the people that signed up to take it. Some say 80% have signed up to take it. I think what you said is, okay, then we're moving on. I mean, is that going to be the strategy right now? How much time do they get? You know, these people are in the next phases are looking at this and saying, come on, guys, you've had your turn, let's move along. Well, we've had those conversations with the hospital association and with a number of the hospital CEOs. Part of it was over the holidays, with, when they were short-staffed already, look, they're, they're overworked. They're short-staffed. They're trying to help take care of patients, and some of them were hesitant to say, I don't want to get the vaccine while it's the holidays and while I'm, I don't have a full complement. So I think after, that, that's going to start picking up. Those percentages are going up. Uh, some hospitals are like 80% of their staff is, is, is getting it. Some are not doing as well. Nursing homes are actually much lower, and that's a problem we're more concerned about. Um, but we're trying to encourage, get the hospitals to get a higher percentage of their staff covered. We're getting the hospital association to do that. Um, and I think they're going, we're going to help convince people that they need to do it. But, um, we're, yeah, we're going to have to, we can't just leave them sitting in freezers at the hospital. If they're not going to use them, we're going to <laughs> send them somewhere else. There's no question about that. We've, we've let them know that. Um, another part of it is, like, you know, some of the beds aren't filled. So I think I heard this discussion today where when you talk about the percentages used, we sent out 100% of the beds in nursing homes and 100% of the hospitals, but they're 70% they're full. So, you know, 70% is really 100% of all they have. They don't have any more. <laughs> you know, there's 30% left. We're going to take them and send them somewhere else. Maybe Dr. Chan can talk. I think we're going to work our way through that right now. It's just uh, discussions with the hospital association, with the heads of the hospital systems, uh, saying, look, um, we, we really need you to pick up the pace. We're not here to try to, you know, uh, you know force people to move at a, at, a, at a rate faster than they feel is safe and, and effective, but we want them to know that you can't just sit around forever because other people are desperately in need of these vaccines, and if you're not going to use them, we're going to have to figure out something else. That's a, there's no, I don't think we have an exact deadline. We just have the ability and now to say we may have the option to do this. It's not saying if you don't use them by this time, they're going to be removed. Governor, I'd like to ask you, in the midst of the pandemic, there's a distraction going on in the nation's capital right now. Demonstrators on the streets of Washington tomorrow. Uh, there'll be the certification of the electoral college vote. Thirteen Republicans now in the Senate joining in on this effort. Do you view this in your party as a last gasp of Trumpism or something long term that your political party is going to have to deal with in sustained ways moving forward? Well, I guess that's a million dollar question, uh, Tom. I, I, I I am, you know, I've been very clear on my views on this repeatedly. Um, I, I think it's a terrible mistake. Um, I think it undermines the very uh, basics of our democracy. I, I, you know, it, there's no question, there's no, there's no there there. Uh, Joe Biden is going to be sworn in on January 20th as the next president of the United States. Um, this is a, a perfunctory process that... You know, there's no question, and for these senators to raise this issue, these folks in the House to make this, because Donald Trump is pressuring them to do it, I think is a terrible mistake for, the, for those senators and congressmen. I think it's bad for the Republican Party, bad for the country. I think, it's, uh, uh, I think it, it, it is uh, destructive to our democracy, and I think it diminishes our standing in the world. I haven't heard any promise about that. I, I would find it you know, shocking if they would even really seriously consider overriding the veto in the middle of the worst economic crisis we've had uh, in our lifetime in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, we, we simply can't afford it, uh, massive tax hikes in the middle of a crisis. So I'm hoping they'll, cooler heads will prevail. Anybody else? Uh, in one of the phases on there was high-risk inmates, but what about the general population 
you know, we're all close together and it's all at somewhat high risk. When will the entire universe of prison inmates be I'm not sure. I'll let Dr. Chan talk about that. Thank you for that question. So with high risk inmates, we're looking at individuals who have underlying medical conditions, of course, that might put them at risk for COVID-19. Um, in terms of the general population, it will be in later phases, um, likely into phase two. So. Can I make a follow up? Even healthy inmates, do they have a higher risk than uh, understood. And, you know, as we get more vaccine, we'll be able to provide um, more and more vaccines to the correctional setting. And so if we're able to do them earlier, we certainly will. Is the state able to provide everything that local governments say they need to carry out this job? And also, what is it that Maryland and other states need from the federal government to, to, to do this massive undertaking? To, to do the what? To complete this massive undertaking. Well, I think we're going to um, uh, figure out what, what people at the local government may need. We're going to try to provide whatever they do need. And at this point, um, I don't know that we have any unmet needs. But if we do, we're certainly going to make the federal government aware of it. Um, at this stage, uh, for the next uh, you know month or two, we're you know it's a it's a limited uh, mission, uh, and it's being handled in the nursing homes, in the hospitals, and the local health departments, and we're trying to provide support. The next phase is completely different, where we move into it's going to be in every doctor's office and every pharmacy, and we're going to be standing up uh, clinics in the community like we did you know in testing. It's a whole different. It's a whole different mission, but as we get into the general populations, this thing is going to grow and change, I'm sure, as it did with, you know, testing. There's no real national strategy and plan. I'm sure it's going to evolve on an ongoing basis. Last question. When do you intend to get vaccinated? What's that? When do you intend to take the vaccine? Well, do you intend to get vaccinated? Yeah, I, I do intend to get vaccinated, and I haven't uh, figured out exactly when. I, say, I said early on, um, I mean, I am in a high-risk, co- uh, you know, with, with – uh, comorbidities, but I said I wanted to make sure we were getting them out to our hospitals and uh, nursing homes, which we are doing now. So, you know, so, some, sometime when it's appropriate, I certainly will.